Problematic is a video game by Liz Ryerson that you can read about and play for free on her website. <laughs> My name is Brendan Vance. I'm a professional game developer and amateur game critic. Uh, one year ago today, I published an article on my blog entitled Fashion, Emptiness, and Problematic. And it really represented a turning point, I think, in my career, uh, certainly in my path as a writer. Beforehand, I had done a lot of, I don't know, trying to catch the zeitgeist or something. I wrote about Mass Effect, I wrote about Mario a couple times, but I came across this thing at a kind of a dark time in my life. I was working as a UI programmer on a, a project that really was not going well. I was doing a lot of crunch, um, and I was just sort of asking myself, well, you know, what is the point of any of this anymore? What is the point of making video games? Is this what making video games is all that it is? You know, am I just making these pop-up books? Just making these buttons flash? Making this text scale correctly to fit in the... Anyway. <laughs> I, my friend Simelacine showed me uh, Liz Ryerson and this game she'd made and it really changed the way that I thought about uh, everything about video games it made me realize that a game doesn't have to be about teaching the player what to do and then the player does it and they get some fictional phantasmic reward games can be about more and they actually can do it almost without a budget you know without the kinds of resources that we typically hold to be the the forces that create video games you know uh, money money and time and suffering so this is a couple of things this is a quick look uh, a let's play of problematic from beginning to end it took me about an hour I have played it a few times before and it's also an attempt to offer uh, some commentary I had hoped that by waiting a year <laughs> to record this I would have um, other people people other than myself would have written more uh, critical response to Attic. And a few people did, but it really was not very many. And so it puts me in an awkward position because rather than responding to Ryerson and to other people and to the conversation, um, I'm kind of responding to myself. A year ago, <laughs> when I wrote at a emptiness, but you know that's fine. Um, it's very important to me that this game doesn't just go away. We kind of live at a time when you can find small games by the hundreds on places like Itch and Game Jolt, and that's great. But the sort of deluge of quote-unquote content can make it difficult to keep track of things. Um, and although we believe that, you know, cream should rise to the top, that we should at some point obtain consensus on which of, of the, these, you know, select things from this tremendous volume of work that we should, you know, raise up. I don't think that that's happening, and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think the, the culture is sort of splintered 
now, and we're not going to get that back again if we ever had it. So what I want to do is, you know, hold on to the things that are important to me. And this game is one of those things. And I want to make sure that people don't forget about Problematic. So without further ado, this is Problematic. So the game begins in uh, this uh, large sort of it's almost like a, a body with organs in it this is the eponymous attic there are eight rooms separated by this kind of green space at least initially and only one of the rooms is open at a time so you find it and you enter it and in there is a, a glyph the symbology of the glyphs I find really interesting. They might represent like maybe a traumatic memory or something. You know, there's this thing that the, the attic is like a representation of the mind of the protagonist, I claim. And so the, the content of the attic would be the content of the protagonist's mind. Uh, and I think what the game is, is sort of the protagonist uh, playing back through experiences that she's had and her perspective on them kind of changes over time throughout the game's three acts. People like to either celebrate or demonize Attic for a game that is sort of unwilling to teach the player what to do. I think this is kind of not accurate. This room, for example, is actually a fairly effective tutorial. We see all of the elements um, present in the first act of the game. They're all right here. Walls you, that you sort of touch, the black walls, um, walls you pass through, the, that white one, that gray one on the bottom. The uh, cross guy character, that cross-shaped thing that hounds you. And the exit is rather clearly marked up in the top right. The cross guy, when you touch it, makes the screen shake, right? It sort of conditions you to not want to go near the thing. Especially, like, this construction, it's a very traditional platformer game, right? It's like there's a thing that's trying to get you, you want to not touch the thing, and you want to jump uh, up and to the right, and you want to get out of here. Uh, the game will subvert the role of that cross guy later. but. In the beginning, I think it's important that you, you sort of learn to fear them. So now we're, we're back here. Um, after completing each room, you circle back to the eponymous attic. A new room will have unlocked somewhere in here. I like the, the sort of white mist uh, speckled around the top of this place. Reminds me of like a you know, the, the new sphere, the idea that there's some cloud of thought floating around the planet from which we draw all of our ideas. I also think it's just, you know, it's a very interesting, it's sort of a beautiful space, or at least I've come to appreciate it that way. I think the use of color is quite strong, um, primary colors or near primary colors. We see a lot of this game's a lot about binaries right here we can see a lot of these rooms will have these two uh figure ground these are like you know a person facing up and a person facing down um which is in some ways actually a call out to later in the game but is also you know the game is about masculinity and femininity right or really i think more broadly it's about the idea that we trap people by uh, lumping them into to one thing or the other often against their will and it sort of plays out at every level of the project right the there are there's you know there's solid space there are walls and there are not walls um the rooms do these rooms here have figures in, in various positions that are kind of abstractly representative of, of binaries
this room we start to see the game get a little bit more attic-y. Um, here we see tiles that you pass behind um, and tiles that you don't, even though they're not collidable. One of the things I wrote about a lot in Emptiness is, you know, our idea that because games are designed, um, everything must have, like, use. And specifically, it must have use with reference to uh, game mechanics. Um, a common criticism of this game is, you know, why does the player pass behind those things? There's not a puzzle that we're not hiding coins behind there. Um, we're not requiring you to use it in any way, and therefore, is it not, you know, simply a, a example of bad feedback? You, you, I can't tell where I am. I'm confused, and confusion we've been taught is always bad. Um, I think that's all kind of bullshit, and I, I really come to stand by that perspective more and more. I actually really like that there are walls that you pass behind in this game. It's a, a form of composition, right? It's one that we're not used to. But there's a lot of good things that we're not used to. Almost all of the things that are good we're not used to, in fact. This game, um, this part is sort of furthermore uh, establishing the relationship. Ah, there I just hit the magical R key, which currently causes a level to reset. I did so because the cross guys had blocked my path forward. This level kind of teaches you to reset. Um, the cross guys get in your way, you reset, they're not in your way, and now you know where you have to go. You exit, it's fine. Again, people say the game doesn't sort of tell you what to do, although there are a lot of kind of traditional HCI practices at use here in the game's first act. You see more uh, figure ground stuff happening here. A couple of abstract figures um, sort of presiding over this glyph. I really like this room. Um, it gets Every room gets increasingly complicated, right? You, you will get through the first act. Uh, later we'll see uh, two more versions of this room kind of increasingly um, overgrown and disheveled. But in this form, I actually find it, it's quite sort of freeing. You have this big, long jump. Um, Ryers in place with the mechanics of the game quite frequently, right? In this room, you jump higher. In other rooms, you, you don't jump at all. It's kind of a design... It's like an act of heresy to change the feel of the platform mechanics halfway through the game. But again... That's kind of an arbitrary stylistic decision that has been uh, imposed on us by a very particular idea about what a platform game should be like. I think that <laughs> Mario has a lot to answer for in that regard. But it's also, you know, the I like I really like the color. It feels like a sunset or some kind of some kind of, you know, um, feel. for me this room is actually sort of like respite. It's a lot less claustrophobic, certainly, than the others. Here I'm actually wondering. I, I did this thing in this game quite often where I tried the solution from the later version of the room in the earlier version, only to realize after m fucking around for five minutes that the solution was much simpler than I was attempting. This room, the yellow room, you see this a couple more times as well. Here we're getting like very attic-y, right? There are these columns, these sort of towers, uh, erections, if you will. And the blue tiles and the gray tiles you can get through, but the more complicated ones you can't. We're making our way to that, again, red and yellow area on the far right. Although, given the visual complexity of the environment, it's a bit difficult to uh, find out right away that that's where you're trying to go. Which, again, I've written about is kind of an intentional choice. A choice that I like. Uh, 
This room is, I think, really maybe the most beautiful room in the game, just in terms of the use of color. It's one of the only rooms where these like shapes actually sort of resemble organic forms. A lot about this game is kind of... I guess it's not organic or inorganic, it's kind of like a some other mode of representation. It's very brutalist, it's very structural most of the time. This is also the first big uh, point of getting stuck, right? Here in that little alcove, for example, if you find yourself in there with the cross guys on top of you, you become trapped and can't escape. Which, you know, if you've read Emptiness is um, ripe with symbolic importance. But at present we can use the magical R key to reset our progress. What we're trying to do in this room, and it is telegraphed by the game mechanics, although she doesn't give it away, we need to hit that spot up there, which will open a gate on the far side of the road. As a sound cue, see? Feedback. Donald Norman. Right. People always act like this game is this monolith of sort of obtuse, impenetrable difficulty. And I don't really think it is. It's kind of a game that is a little bit alien at first, but it really wants you to understand it, and if you put in a little bit of effort, you know, it starts to feel like home after a while. So the first major insight in this game is in fact that the cross guys are not purely your enemy. In here, we actually have to make use of them to ascend to the top of, of this room. That word overgrown, very everything. This game becomes increasingly overgrown. The protagonist's mind kind of... Um, Ryerson wrote an article called... or a talk. It was a talk at QGCon originally. It was called The Abstract and the Feminine. Um, she wrote uh, in that talk, quote, The more weight you place into a concept, the more it begins to crumble. The more you look into this issue, the farther things spiral down into a wormhole. There's a lot of spiraling down in Attic. So this is the Hell Room. One of the <laughs> more complicated claims I make in Emptiness is that this room represents a traumatic recollection of... Uh, being a victim of sexual assault. I thought sort of long and hard before even sort of putting that claim forward. I myself have not had that experience. It's very self-conscious about reading into somebody else's work kind of on that basis. I decided to go forward with it at the time, although I'm not sure how I feel about it. There's this one cross guy here, right, faster than any other in the game, and it just sort of hounds you incessantly. Um, if you try and take the direct approach to the room, it is it's completely impossible to make any progress, right? There are these, like, undulating flesh textures on the walls and this, like, murmuring demon voices in the background. Um, the platformer mechanics are actually intentionally sabotaged in this room. Sometimes when you push jump, the jump is delayed. Sometimes when you push it, um, you just don't jump at all, which makes it very difficult to get around. It, it produces like a feeling of helplessness, right? You'll also see the character sprite. It's like a little bit smaller than in most of the places in the game. Also, if you hit the magical R key in that room, as I just did, rather than simply returning to the beginning of the room, as we did in the other two cases, um, the screen fades to black and we go all the way out to the beginning. You note the glyph there that we, that we used to get in here is also a little bit smaller. I think it's appropriate because the room makes you feel small. You see here the, the cross guy like leers at you 
as you, you find this hidden structure that actually leads you sort of this a path of safety around the outside of the room. But the whole while you're doing it, you see that thing kind of trying to get you. It's like menacing you. It's very um, disturbing. I hated being in this room, especially the first time I played it. It made me feel like powerless and frustrated. And I don't know. I don't like being in here. But if you take the hidden passage, you know, there is a way around, of course. the My reading of that is, you know, that the way forward is not obvious to you at first. After you complete hell, the staticky swell has taken over in the, the soundtrack, right? The attic is kind of becoming uninhabitable, right? Discord is uh, setting in. You know, what was once sort of a kind of pleasant sp space is becoming more hostile, right? You're, I, I, my reading is that the protagonist is being overwhelmed um, by, you know, her their memories. Here we see the introduction of the, the third character in the game, that square girl right there. When you touch them, the level uh, sort of resets. Um, impudently I wrote in emptiness that it was almost as if the you know the prospect of like in the abstract and the feminine Ryerson writes that you know masculinity is consistency but femininity as a cultural construct is, is to appear to be inconsistent Actually, that was a quote from Ryerson quoted a person named Aaron Stevens North who said that. And I think that's represented the square girls we'll see later are sort of emblematic of the construct of femininity, the cross guys of masculinity, and their behavior is very much consistent with that. The cross guys are like, you know, consistent that they are these in-world sort of embodied things, whereas the square girls kind of cause you to glitch. The level resets. The way you get out of this room is by, uh, the exit is randomly selected from a group of five or so. And that happened to be uh, number three. I like that room. It feels big because the walls wrap. You know, it's like this giant uh, chasm. If you take too long finding the solution to that room, you actually rotate all the way around uh, until you're sort of upside down, which we will soon see foreshadows the game's second act. So this room is very interesting. Um, you, you have to do this sort of... <laughs> okay, the cross guys are kind of hounding you, but the, the screen moves very slowly. You're sort of doing this death march forward as if, you know, I think that the metaphor is that the protagonist is kind of in a very literal sense being oppressed by these um, uh, masculine kind of things and struggling forward against them, but, but kind of feeling awful the whole time. This one... Um, that one up top slowly drifts towards the tile. Once it touches it, um, you end up here, which is the, I call this the monolith. It's this kind of strange shape. It's like a, either like a goat head or <laughs> it looks a little bit like ovaries, maybe. And this is like a, the, the point of transformation. Um, like in 2001, A Space Odyssey or something, you know, it's this, this place where you go to. Um, so we find ourselves in the bottom half of that room, and we now have to kind of... The obelisk, the, the monolith, allows you to rewind, right? We have this rewind sound effect playing, and we're traveling backwards, sort of through the, the underbelly of that place we were in before. It's like... 
I don't know, the, the, that was the life you were living, right? This kind of dreadful death march forward under, under, um, these harmful kind of constructs. And in order to escape that, you have to kind of go through this bizarre kind of non-linear, um, path. And it's, it's actually quite difficult. The camera scrolls past you. And if you can't keep up, you kind of get lost um, in the, the background, and you have to use the magical R key to reset. It's sort of like, I don't know, it's like a, a moment of realization where it becomes apparent that, you know, the, the way that you were living is not the way, it's not the only way that you could live, but to sort of rewind that mountain of experiences and kind of assumptions you've gathered, you know, it requires effort, it requires uh, pain. So here we have ra we've made it to the uh, second act, we're at the title screen again. And the thing about the second act is now we're, we're traveling inside the walls, right? So the walls, another binary, right? Uh, figure and ground, space and solid, we find are not actually the, the binary that we thought they were. You can be inside of these black spaces. You can traverse them. Another notable feature of the second act, the world has quite literally turned upside down. The attic sort of continues to get complicated, increasingly complicated as you, you make your way through this act. It's, I think, a representation of the protagonist's um, mental state, kind of not necessarily deteriorating, but uh, complicating. Uh, Zolani Stewart always talks about how we should try to, to complicate our understanding of the world through art. And I think in this case, you know, the protagonist is sort of through through thinking about things has complicated the, their understanding of themselves. It's kind of this, this whole game is kind of about complicating your uh, in the attempt to move beyond um, binaries. Everything has to kind of get weird <laughs> first, and maybe it has to stay weird. We're looking again for a glyph, another memory, um, one of the same memories, but maybe our perspective has changed. So we return here to, this is actually the same room, room one. Go fuck yourself. The game, I, I guess, you know, on some level, it's not hard to understand why people read Attic as being hostile to them. The game literally tells them to go fuck themselves. Uh, on more than one occasion. So here, we exploit, well, we have to actually exploit this kind of glitch in the screen mapping where you can see the protagonist's head poking up at the bottom there. You actually use the cross guy to help you jump through the bottom of the screen, or jump through the top to get to that area in the bottom and hit the red zone. The, this room is actually see, continually changing. That kind of glowing reef has appeared. I see a glimpse of the glyph there. I believe the progression in terms of room to room is actually the same in Act 2 as it was in Act 1. Except each room, now that you can travel through walls, gets more complicated, right? Because now a solution here. There's a way of like looking at this memory or whatever it is that had not been apparent to us in the previous acts. You know, the world appeared to be a lot more consistent back then, but it was also kind of suffocating. <laughs> I'm going to spend a lot of time in this room um, actually attempting to perform the solution to the, the third iteration of it, where this is actually only the second 
um, that purpley yellow thing will later be relevant to us, but I did not know as I was recording this footage that it was not relevant yet. So I'm afraid you'll have to bear with me here. I'd like to point out that um, my reading of the game is surely not the only possible reading. Attic is a game that very easily affords kind of multiple perspectives, which is actually kind of an uncommon thing in video games. Um, I think the reason for that, or part of the reason for that, is that um, our emphasis on design simplicity renders us kind of incapable of dealing with the messiness that that art requires, you know, in order for something to be... Like, art is about reaching beyond the limits of what you can currently explicate, right? You're trying to explicate the inexplicable, um, in my opinion, anyway. Whereas games often fall into the trap of explicating the very explicable, and you end up with, you know, our, our sort of XBLA crop of um, indie games that are a little bit art-facing, but they tend to feel very trite because they try to pass off their you know, artistic statement in the form of like one extremely elegant mechanic. And you just can't say a lot with that. You know, if you want to say something complex, you have to make a piece of software that features complexity in the same way that you would have to write a novel that features complexity or any other form. We spent a lot of time, I think, in indie games, especially since 2008, trying to kind of get at, you know, we were obsessed with this, um, the complexity from simplicity, right? You have your, your one relationship that you somehow spin off into like a 10 hour game experience. I'd really rather have like something like this where you know, length is not a concern for us. We don't need to provide 10 hours of entertaining content. And if the player is invested, you don't even need to worry about producing something that can be immediately understood without the use of a manual. Um, Attic is a game that kind of asks the player to meet it halfway. And when you do that, um, I find it's just far more rewarding than anything that kind of attempts to to sort of beckon you and like lull you in and you know this is this breadcrumb trailing you into understanding all of the game's mechanics and then all of the game's dynamics and somehow eventually if we teach you one tiny little thing at a time we're going to bring you to some moment of catharsis which I guess in, in my experience with video games never really comes, right? Like, what do you feel at the end of Skyrim? I don't know. I didn't feel anything. But in a game like this, you're feeling things throughout, you know? It's like a legitimate work of art in that sense. Or a work of media. This is a more complex version of that uh, airy room from Act 1. It's a pretty clever um, puzzle that we'll see in the third act to do, to do with that room, but in that iteration, all it really requires is that insight that you need to use screen wrapping to teleport yourself into the previously inaccessible black space. This room, you can't move the character. You're, what you're actually moving is the cross guys. You see there, um, those square girls are sort of dragging that glyph around. Every character in this game has a different relationship to those glyphs, and I haven't really been able to decode, at least, or, or to provide a, a, satisfy, a reading that satisfies me as to kind of what they what they specifically represent. 
in some level the glyphs are kind of like a MacGuffin or this thing that everything wants. There's something that, you know, everybody's trying to possess, right? Um, which I guess you could read as a sort of cultural critique, right? That our, our present society is very much oriented around possession of, of things, almost of anything. Anything that is valuable, we, we want it. Almost for no reason a lot of the time. You could also, you know, claim that, well, if the glyphs are, are sort of memories, maybe they are, maybe they're more like units of, like, freedom or of agency or of, of being for the protagonist, you know, units of, of identity, perhaps. Here I'm, I'm falling infinitely through that sort of orange or yellow and purple corridor on the left. There's an interesting thing that happens there uh, in the game's third act in the next iteration of this room. But you sort of, in this room especially, you want to pursue that glyph. You think, well, I want that thing. I actually, when I first played it, I spent a lot of time trying to get it. As it turns out, it's not at all the thing that you're trying to get. You're just trying to get to. Uh, one of these, you know, exit zones, same as always. There's also the notion that, you know, these concepts of the cross guys and the square girls are, are attacking the glyphs. That they're sort of colonizing them. For whatever purpose. You know, in capitalism, there's a lot of appropriation for no reason. Right? Um... Like, if there is a thing, we must possess the thing, even if we have no particular utility or use for it, if only to deny it to our ostensible competitors. You can hear that, um, once again, this static swelling is starting to, to kick up, almost in anticipation, I think, of having to return to that hell room. There, that yellow tile kind of glitches us in here. It's uh, predicting, I think hinting at uh, a game mechanic that we're about to see. So here, <laughs> you're collecting units of F and units of M. I think it, it's not much of a stretch to suggest that the F is for female and that the M is for male. I think returning again to um, the abstract and the feminine, we kind of have, well this is interesting, right? The, the yellow spots when you touch them give you M, but those glyphs, which we were just discussing, give you F. So perhaps, you know, we could say that maybe this room actually implies quite strongly that the glyph is, you know, that concept of the abstract and the feminine, it's this appearance of inconsistency, this unit of, like, of brilliance, or, you know, of inspiration by less direct means, whereas the doors, the yellow units, the yellow ones allow you to, uh, when you spend one of them, you can use a magical button to teleport uh, two tiles to the right, I think. Which is kind of like a, you know, it's almost like maleness in this game is like game mechanic, right? Um, the cross guys are very game mechanic-y, they're very platform-y. Whereas femaleness is like glitch. It's sort of the, the subversion of gameness in the, the traditional sense that we understand it. I think our objective here, although it's, you know, well, it's somewhat telegraphed, is to, uh, you collect enough of those glyphs that the exit uh, kind of reveals itself to you. It's towards the lower right of this room, although as it wraps at the edges, you, you kind of need to play it. To, you, when you play this, you get a really strong sense of the geography of this place, 
especially because you have to conserve your teleports. You kind of learn how you can get in and around things without having to spend too many of them. Although it probably looks very confusing to an observer, you know. When, as you become familiar with these spaces, you know, they, they're not confusing. You learn to read the walls. You learn to read which, which tiles you can pass through and which you can't. And again, it, it ends up becoming like a... It's like a place that you've lived. It's like familiar to you. I think, I, I argue in emptiness that the reason the environment looks complex and confusing at first is so that you can come eventually to know it. And then once you do, um, these kind of twisted corridors that, again, are representative of the ideals that have kind of been encoded in this protagonist's mind. The attic, again, is the protagonist's mind in my reading. Um, once you come to understand like the nature of the shape of these corridors, it's like you can kind of read, you, you, you have empathy for the protagonist. You understand what all of this means and you can sort of start to traverse it. In some ways you're like a, a magical helper to the, the protagonist in, in their personal journey that takes place over the course of this game. Like maybe you're, you're like a, well, arguably a benevolent uh, spirit. This is the part where you're supposed to go into hell. We see the glyph in there bouncing around. Um, but we'll see an interesting thing happen. So that yellow teleports you into the wall, but then you think you're going to fall into the room with the glyph, but you actually don't. It's like the protagonist herself um, sort of exercises some kind of agency, right? It uses that magical ability to teleport you two tiles to the right, so that you, rather than going back to that room, which again perhaps a memory of a very bad experience. Um, you instead fall past it once more through the monolith and into one of these rewind sequences. Look at that transition. That is fucking brilliant. I love this music. This is my favorite my favorite music in this game. Once again, we're told to go fuck ourselves. So, right here, you know, it's interesting, right? We thought the room, okay, at first there was just the room and you get to the exit, but then you find out there's this little area um, kind of underneath it with that red and yellow tile. That's like another way out. And now, in the third act, um, you can see me hopping around down there a little bit. Yeah. There's even a third way forward. Um, sort of like, you know, Hegel talks about dialectic, right? That, okay, there's, there's like, you could either go left or you could go right. Um, or, you know, you have like a, we often talk about spectrums in our society. Like, are you conservative or are you liberal? And there are only two poles. But the, the whole idea about like dialectic is you take those conflicting two ideas and rather than like trying to like pick one or go halfway between one, you like combine them, you synthesize, right? You take the elements of both and, and use them to produce some something of a higher order. And maybe that is sort of what's happening in this game, right? You have your initial path, your direct path, your... Um, was it your consistent path, right? The first act, the the male path. Um, and then maybe the second act is kind of more like some alternate, you're, you're like hiding in the, in the second path, right? You're hiding in the walls. You're, you're sort of, which maybe is, is representative of like a female path through society. It's kind of like cowering away from these cross guys, kind of lurking at the periphery of society. But now... In the third act, um, things kind of get even stranger, and there is this like hypothetical, this hypothetical new way forward that is kind of a 
an extension of, of everything that you previously experienced, right? A synthesis into uh, some higher order of living. I don't know. This puzzle is pretty complicated. Um, the thing that you're seeing me not get here <laughs> for a couple minutes is that those white and blue tiles are like... It's like a gate. It's a teleporter. One of them transfers you into the other, like actually like a portal in, in Portal. Almost exactly like that. Um, and using that, you can eventually gain access to the, the way out of this room. From this one's actually from from Myerson, from the abstract and the feminine. Um, the more weight you place into a concept, the more oh I've actually told you this one before. The more weight you place into a concept, the more it begins to crumble. The more you look into this issue, the further things spiral down into a wormhole. So yes, I did mention this earlier, and now we have uh, spiraled down. These environments have kind of become almost unrecognizable without the context of having been in this room a couple times before. You know, it, it looks kind of very alien to us. I think it's sort of like things kind of get worse before they get better. The, the character, there's like this gradually developing identity crisis that culminates with something resembling a boss fight in a couple of rooms here and then resolves into calm so we're sort of as the protagonist uh, pushes forward into these kind of intellectual frontiers they become less and less uh, certain of themselves they literally begin to doubt who they are there is me successfully using these blue gates. And there's our audio cue letting us know that the gate to lead the room is now open. Feedback. Donald Norman. People say this game is... I actually, I said that this game is notable for its lack of feedback. I've kind of revised my opinion on that. I wish I could feel sorry for you, but I don't feel anything. The protagonist, there's some kind of implied that the you, the second person in this prose, or in the, the, these passages, is um, implied sort of throughout the game. There is this other to which someone is speaking. We never really learn who that other is. I speculated an emptiness, um, you know, who, who is, when the game says go fuck yourself, who is speaking and to whom does it speak, I'm not really sure, it might be, you know, the, the player, um, it might be the protagonist talking to themselves or to some past version of themselves, it could be this person that in my reading was uh, abusing them. You know, in the hell room. This version of the towers room. I like that uh, animating background. You know, I would again, I would claim this is a very sort of beautiful looking game, especially once you start to decode which tiles are uh, traversable and which ones aren't. It gains a sense of structure and, and composition that is, you know, not easy to do. Ryerson is a very skilled designer. Ah, so if you, when you start falling really far and really fast, that text sort of pops up in your face. Um, maybe you'll wake up with your guts in a pile on the fucking ground. Which is a <laughs> lurid, kind of disturbing image, I don't know, it's maybe representative of 
somebody somebody who can't get to sleep because they're afraid of what might happen to them. You know, it's insomnia, maybe, right? Or anxiety. I love the way that it's sort of represented here, right? The way you're... It's like, you know, when you're, your brain kind of... You're trying to go to bed and your brain starts, like, spiraling faster and faster. Your thoughts kind of exit your, your control. And I feel like the protagonist accelerating downward and then that that as she reaches as they reach terminal velocity um that message comes up it's a really interesting kind of abstract representation of well an experience that i've had anyway probably of a pretty common human experience you know stuff like that it's just it's really smart um this is how you do things with video games it's not this impossible, mysterious, unknowable. There's no reason to ask, can games be art? Like, fucking, of course they can. You just have to... You have to give up a lot of that dogma that we've been told is the way that you make video games. And as a player, you have to give up that dogma where you've been told that, you know, the game is completely beholden to you. It's like, this is a collaboration between the person authoring the software and the person using it. And you kind of have to, each party has to aspire to uh, communicate with the other, right? All forms of art are this, this act of transmission of, of thought from, from one person to another. And, you know, you advocate that when you demand that, like, well, I don't want to have to try, I don't want to have to think, I don't want to have to struggle. So in this room, this is the room where almost everybody gets hopelessly stuck um, when they play Attic. Because for me, at least, the, the not obvious thing was that, you know, the, you consume maleness, M, <laughs> um, those yellow tiles that I'm collecting here, to, to teleport, right? You consume them. But it, it didn't occur to me that, you know, your, your goal here is actually to accumulate, I think, 13 of them simultaneously because I was just teleporting around well I'm just going to collect all the yellow things but by teleporting I was spending that resource and then you never make it up to 13 because you're constantly spending it and it, I, I didn't clue in that I would actually have to hold on to it um, I had to tweet Liz Ryerson to ask her how to get through this part and, and she gave me a hint ended up being helpful. I went back to it the next day. It was fine. And that's the kind of thing that you have to do with a game like this. <laughs> I, it took me like three nights of three different runs at it, getting a little further each time. Okay. So here is that boss fight like thing I was telling you about earlier. It's like, <laughs> this is box, this physics box that you, you would think is maybe important because nowhere else in the game is there one of these. It kind of looks like a fly in a cage or something. Um, and there are these spider webs, these like things that you can clear away as you touch them, but neither of those are directly relevant to how you progress in the level. I think they're maybe more of a narrative element. But you see, you're kind of, you're being assaulted, or you're being pursued doggedly by these square girls, and every time they touch you, you know, the environment resets. I spent, when I first played this, almost an hour trying to get away from them in the way that you're seeing me try to get away from them right here, because I had not yet grasped the central insight of the game, really, which is, once again, that, you know, you've you've gained something in, in the way through this attic. You can actually, in this room, use the magical key to teleport yourself two tiles in any direction um, through walls if you want to. It's kind of like, you know, that's like, the game is, the protagonist becomes empowered through this, this process of intellectual exploration. Um, and this room is about, like, realizing that power. Um, it doesn't spell it out for you. It doesn't flash a message up saying, hey, remember to use the R key. Maybe it's the X key. Um, 
And it's important that it doesn't telegraph that to you, right? Because it's... The way that you get catharsis in video games is by doing the damn thing yourself. Um, by coddling players, we make that impossible. So there are these portals, these wormholes <laughs> in here that when you touch them, you notice that the square girls actually stop pursuing you at that point. There's one. And <laughs> the text up here says, I don't know who I am in this like glitchy flashing neon, which, you know, is, this is the, the climax, right, of the protagonist's identity crisis. Um, once you touch a portal, what's actually happened, although it's not obvious right at first, is that you, the protagonist, have been split into two uh, beings. So there's another little version of you, a white character out there, um, that gets kind of randomly dumped somewhere else in the level, and when you move left, they move left, and when you move right, they move right. Um, so the trick in this room is kind of figuring out, A, that that other one exists, and then B, navigating yourself so that you can meet up with them, right? You, you take these two halves and you kind of have to, through struggle, bring them back together. I really like the environment here. This is like a, there's this like city looking place down here, which is maybe, like, I think this, this whole process is like several years of a person's life, of the protagonist's life, right? And they kind of maybe travel to different places, all of which are, you know, the city is maybe one of them, and they're all kind of mapped in, into this one complicated geography. In the lower left of this room, you, you see like some sort of shapes that kind of look like, you know, people a little bit. Maybe like, like there's one. These sort of twisted forms. What I'm doing here is, since I've already played this game and already know what to do, I'm looking for my other half, which is kind of, you know, again, this is the climax of the game, this is sort of the, the peak, the, the moment, um, and looking for the other half of you is to, to a large extent what this game is all about, or to take these two, you know, these two aspects of a binary and to transcend them. This game is about transcendence, which, you know, is one of the... Transformation, for me, is... There's, there's the other person. Um, and now I have, to, I have to try and find them. Transcendence is, is sort of a recurring theme in my life. <laughs> it's like a thing that I want that I can't really get. Um, which is maybe the reason why Attic resonated as strongly as it did with me. Ah, so you, you have to do this little dance, right? Because when you teleport, they teleport. Um, so I'm like trying to figure out kind of how I can navigate myself so that we actually make contact. I think what happened there was one of us inadvertently teleported into a square girl, causing the level to reset. That can happen here, where your, your other half hits one of the square girls and it kind of resets without you quite grasping what had happened at first. Although, the fact that it resets also kind of clues you in to the fact that there is another one of you. You know, like if you ask yourself why the level reset when I didn't touch one of those things, well, maybe it was because. Something else caused the level to reset. We'll get to the the end sequence pretty soon here. It's one of the things I wanted to present about Attic. I wanted to kind of deconstruct that idea that this game was like the very antithesis of formalism, which is something I myself sort of argued about it. Um, but it isn't really... This game is very difficult to form into a category, right? Some people... 
There we go. And now we're in this like, this is the calm I was talking about. This like, uh, the, the sort of last leg of your journey through this blackness. But some people, you know, want to champion this game on the basis that it's like, you know, you either like walking simulators or you hate walking simulators, and maybe this game is one of them, and either we're for it or we're against it. But this game is not really a walking simulator. I don't think there's anything in the world that is very much like Attic, which is one of the reasons why I like it so much. It's a game that, like Ryerson herself, kind of defies categorization. So in my uh, in emptiness, I think I I'm really not happy with the the, the way that I, I sort of ended my reading of Attic, um, which was that this is emblematic of sort of traveling through some passage from like maleness to the femaleness. I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure about that anymore. In this room. You know, it's another kind of visually complicated space. You're trying to find this gateway. You see a lot of glyphs around. This is an interesting moment, right? This is where all of that, again, the rewind, that rewinding sound effect plays, right? It's like undoing this lifetime of kind of damage. Um, we see like the, all of the, the game's entire soundtrack sort of all blares up at once and the environment um, disintegrates into these like big fat pixels and it's sort of like that final moment of clarity maybe um, or of catharsis where a lot of that kind of crap that had accumulated a lot of the, the the game is this big long like bell curve right you go from being very certain about your place in a world that you despise to being not certain about anything and then towards the end now you're sort of more in this like you know the dialectic again right you you're in this somewhat higher place and you're not necessarily it's not necessarily good or bad but you know, you find that the world was not what you thought. Um, neither better or worse, but that maybe, you know, you're in a better place than you were. This is interesting. Um, when I watched Liz demo this game for somebody at IndieCade, what she did, and you don't have to do this to beat the game, but what she did was see these cross guys once again are like attacking these glyphs and she would go through this room and make sure that she physically separated all of the cross guys so that they could not make it to the glyph um, which she said was you know not something that you have to do but something that she likes to do um, which I think is a clue into what all of these elements kind of represent think maybe you know the, the, it's like the, the the thought I think behind this room is you know as a square girl like the, the protagonist has now become a square girl uh, they, they did so almost because it, it made them capable of combating these these sort of cross guys that get in and ruin everything right it's like it's not something that you can do when you're in the form of the protagonist, when you're that that small person with the light gray tile where your genitals are. It's only it's like a power that's only available to like the the square girl, um, which is maybe why the protagonist decided to go this way. It was you know it's it was all done in an effort to to protect these glyph figures from harm. So there's that blue tile. It's the way out.
so that's kind of where I, I'm at with this game now a year later I think my <laughs> I guess fittingly I'm, I'm like less certain about my initial reading than ever but I think that's probably a good thing this is one of those games that kind of yields like endless complexity right the more it's fractal the more you approach it um, the more strange things kind of become. I think this is an exemplary work of art. It is maybe the best work of art I personally have ever encountered in as kind of a video game form. And I would really... The reason I'm making this, the reason I recorded this, is because I'm interested in showing it to other people. And I hope that even if you didn't want to play the game yourself by sort of taking a look at it vicariously through me, you've gained a little bit of the appreciation for it that I have. Here's another quote from The Abstract and the Feminine. We all want to just arrogantly assume in the sphere of people who think and talk about art that if a work is worth knowing, that if it's culturally significant, it will eventually, in one way or another, make itself known to us. But what if that isn't true at all? What if something that could be a great transformative work in one context disappears every week or every month because its creators weren't in the right place at the right time, or no one around them cared or understood." End quote. I think that we should all aspire to care and understand. I think it's really the least that we could do.